Our distribution, and yeah, that's you know part of it, but it's certainly not the whole part, and it's certainly not the interesting or difficult part or challenging part, um, however you want to look at that. And then finally, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about what what is an enterprise, uh, what does an agile enterprise look like? Um, I'm not convinced anybody's got an answer for that. I'm going to I'm going to give you, you know, my answer, my thoughts on it, but certainly um, I haven't heard a decent answer yet. I've heard some good answers, and um, you know people are on the path. Uh, but I, I certainly have, you know, heard a comprehensive answer that I could actually, you know, buy into. So, anyway, so uh, hopefully, yeah, thinking outside the box a bit. So, what's this financial delivery all about? And it's there's a bunch of interesting things in that. So, the source of that came from some of my work at IBM. So, for six years, I was the chief methodologist for IT with IBM Rational, and, and my job was to go around the world and help organizations understand this Agile stuff. Um, and I, had, you know, I was working with several people doing this, and I would help them scale on it, and I got to see a lot of really good stuff. And I got to see a lot of organizations doing this Agile stuff and Selene stuff fairly well. Um, I got, got to see a lot of organizations that were not doing it so well. And we started noticing patterns. So when I joined IBM in 2006, I didn't want to write it, I, I had no interest at all in doing process stuff. I had no interest at all in creating another methodology. Been there, done that, arrows in the back, not interested. No, thank you. And then after a couple of years of seeing the same patterns over and over and over again, and all these organizations really struggling with this Agile stuff and really investing a lot of time and effort trying to figure it out, and really not getting it, uh, or really you know, mostly getting it, but not quite type stuff, um, we decided, you know what, there's a lot of waste going on here, and we can up the game. So this is what, this, in my mind, this is what Dad's all about. It's all about upping our game. And it's trying to make life easier for everybody involved, because you're not process people, and you probably don't want to be process people. You'd, you'd rather be focused on delivering real value to your, to your customers, to your stakeholders. So let's get this process stuff out of the way, and let you focus on the, on the cool stuff, that, you know, the actual valuable stuff you're supposed to be doing. So, Dad adopts a lot of ideas from, you know, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. I had no interest in doing that. Um, so we adopted a bunch of great ideas from the Agiline um, um, uh, camps, you know, being people, people oriented, being, being very flexible, being learning oriented. Um, we, we promote a hybrid approach. I'll talk about that in a second. We promote a full delivery life cycle. I'll walk you through what, what that implies. I hear a lot of uh, advice in the Agile community that I find rather naive and uh, you know, rather uh, disingenuous. So we'll, we'll talk about what it actually takes to, to do a real Agile delivery, a little more, a little more to it than uh, what, what we've probably been led to believe. And I'll talk a little bit about this concept called enterprise awareness, looking at the bigger picture. Um, I think that's vitally important to any team, not just in enterprises, but um, we've got a, a lot of opportunity to get better. Um, and we also talked about the idea of being solution focused. I think. Uh, one of the interesting and unfortunate things with the Agile movement is, has been the focus on software. In many ways, we, we went back in time, you know, we, we really sort of lost ground by being overly focused on software. Because it's really solutions that we're developing, not, soft, not just software. So our software runs on hardware, there's supporting documentation, we change the business process, we, we change the, the way uh, that the organization is organized sometimes. So there's a bunch of things that we're working on. And Mary was talking about, you know, was, was implying some of this being product focused or solution focused, not just software focused. Um, so she, you know, for those of you who went to Mary's talk just before this one, um, she purposely left out the word software um, in the title of the book because you know we, we need to look beyond software. So I think this is a uh, uh, one of many healthy things to be thinking about. So anyways, there's a bunch of bunch of good ideas there, a bunch of interesting aspects. So let's uh, let's look at a few of them. So one of them is that's a hybrid. I mean, the, the observation, it's not exactly rocket science, is there's a lot of great ideas out there, which is good. There's a lot of great ideas out there. The problem is, there's a lot of great ideas out there. So, how do you choose? First of all, how do you even find out about them? You're certainly not going to find out, uh, out about all your options on the, on the various today's certification courses that are available. You're going to find out about a very small subset of them, and that's great. They're all good ideas, but you're not going to hear the full story. So what do you do, right? And you're not process engineer. So our harsh observation about the software process industry in general, if you want to call it an industry, is that we've had some interesting learning. You know, the IT industry is a bit dysfunctional. We're always talking in extremes. There's always two options. There's a 
this way to do it or that way to do it. You're saying, no, no sort of in-between. And we all know that's not true. So from a process point of view, let's consider the in-betweens. Or let's consider the extremes first of all. So you know, 10 some odd years ago, the rationally unified process was the number one game in town, without a doubt. And their entire message was, here's this bunch of great ideas. And there was a lot, you know, for all the rhetoric and all the you know, bashing of the rock that we've had over the last few years. The reality is, is there was, in fact, a lot of great ideas, which many people in the Agile community are currently reinventing, by the way, if you were to step back and observe things. But be that as it may, there was a bunch of great ideas in the rock, but their entire message was, here's a bunch of great ideas. And because you're process experts, you can tailor it down to something that you know, meets your needs. Right? This is basically their, their entire pitch. Now, unfortunately, um, most organizations struggled with that because they weren't process experts and they would look at the rock and they think, oh, man, this is a bunch of great ideas, we should do it all. Or, oh, this is like a waterfall that we're used to, let's tailor it to a waterfall, which is exactly not the message of rock. But, you know, be that as it may, there were some interesting learning experiences adopting rock. And then Scrum became popular, and their entire message was, here's this small kernel of good ideas, and, and they are, there's a bunch of good ideas in Scrum. Here's this small kernel of stuff from which to start, and because you're process experts, because the team owns the process, yeah, rhetoric, 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 um, you can figure out, you can tailor it up to what you need. So listen to the messages. Something big, let's tailor it down to the middle. Something small, let's tailor it up to the middle. Why not just start in the middle? Wouldn't that make a little more sense? Wouldn't that be a little more effective? Let's start with something that gets the job done. Not too much, not too, you know, just enough, like a, a Goldilocks type of a thing, as opposed to something really huge or something really small. There's a radical concept for you. Of course, the problem is when you start with something in the middle, it's a bigger, it's a bigger problem than we can certify you in in two days and you know all that sort of stuff, right? So it's a, it becomes problematic from a business point of view. So, anyways, there's a bunch of great ideas out there, even from the traditional community. We need, to, you know, we can talk about respect, but let's actually show some respect. The world runs on systems that were developed using the V model. You can't possibly do a financial transaction other than maybe bartering, or even like, or maybe not even a cash transaction, where you know if you do an electronic financial transaction today, you're going to hit several systems that were developed successfully with the V model. So let's just respect that, and let's and many many other things. You can't possibly take a plane. I'm going to be on a plane later on this afternoon. Most of those systems were developed using the V model, so let's just respect the fact that maybe some of these traditional folks did, have, did in fact have a few good ideas that we could leverage. Let alone, as, you know, as um, the Scrum, the Extreme Programming guys, and you know, all, the, all the sexy methodologies uh, that we like to talk about, as well as the not so sexy methodologies. So there's a bunch of good ideas out there, but how do they fit together? So let's uh, keep that in mind for a second. Another thing we like the idea of is that we observe, and this is easy to observe, by the way, empirically, this is a phenomenally easy thing to observe, Agile software development is serial. I apologize for swearing, I just use one of the Agile swear words, serial. But the fact is, is you do something to get started, you know, you can call this inception or initiation or startup, sprint zero, you know, call it whatever you want, but there's a little bit of work to get going. Then you do a little bit of work to build or configure something. And then you do a little bit of work to release it or transition it or deploy it or end phase, you know you know, whatever you want to call it, get it out the door. So you do this, then you do this, and then you do this. That's serial. This is empirically observable. We could choose, and I realize this, I, I just swore, this is not part of our culture to actually admit what we're doing, but this is, we are in fact working in a, in a manner that's serial and large. Now, on a daily basis, hopefully we are in fact iterating and doing all this sort of stuff, but we're working serial and large. So let's just call it as it is. So one of the one of the things about that now you know we use the the, the strong or the uh, the rough terminology for this. The terms don't matter. So if you want to call it initiation instead of inception or startup or whatever, call it whatever whatever makes sense for you. It doesn't really matter. It's the ideas that count. So strong is a good start. I'm sure you're all familiar with this. I'm not going to belabor the point. Bunch of good ideas here. Very prescriptive, by the way. Incredibly prescriptive. There's one way to manage requirements, and one primary way to coordinate work, all that good sort of stuff, right? Incredibly prescriptive, but that's okay. You know, where we look up the word prescription in the dictionary. But it's not complete. When I look at this life cycle, like where does this product backlog come from? 
magically appears, right? How do we get software there? Oh, it just magically happens. Bunch of hand wave, and, and, and you know, Scrum, you know, it has its scope. Purpose lane, they're very clear about that. Like, you, you got to admire them, they're very clear that this is the scope of Scrum. Good for them, right? That's great. They're very honest and clear about that. But it's not the full picture. We know we've got to do a little bit of upfront modeling and playing, because most of you are probably on teams where fairly early in the effort, some, some one of those evil managers came along and they asked some weird questions like, what are you going to produce? What sort, what sort of value are you going to produce for the organization? How long is it going to take? How are you going to do it? How much is it going to cost? And yet they have semi-coherent answers for that. Right? Otherwise you don't get funding, generally, right? So there's a little bit of upfront modeling and planning, and you can call this populating the backlog and throw around whatever goofy terms it, it takes to, to you know, you know, admit, you know, let yourself admit the fact we're doing some upfront thinking. But we're doing some upfront thinking, so let's be very clear about this. And we should probably release our stuff into production every so often. Not such a bad idea, right? This is how we make money or save money, or both, as the case may be. But this is not sufficient. So let's start getting rid of the branding. Right? It's not a scrum meeting, it's a, it's, a, it's a coordination meeting. Nobody sprints through a race. You know, it's like, let's get rid of some of this branding. Let's start going, getting back to some, but like I said, the terminology doesn't really matter, but I, there's a, a reasonable concern in the industry about all the marketing and all the branding and all the, the rhetoric that we hear in the Agile community. That's, that's up our game a bit. Uh, you know, really, we, we can do better. And we also start, you know, start also talking about work items, because it's not just requirements that we're implementing. We're fixing defects. We help, my team helps other teams. You know, there's a bunch of work that we do on projects, not just implementing the requirements. So let's explicitly show that. And let's also make, you know, a lot of people have been redoing, uh, redrawing product backlogs to show bigger chunk of these towards the bottom, because we don't want to look at details yet for things that are far away, we don't want to worry about details for things that are coming up. So you can be a little bit smarter about the way we depict these things. But that's not enough. Because we know we work in phases, or you know, you know, sprint zero and hardening sprints, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, let's make it explicit. Let's also start, instead of just doing a value-driven approach, let's do a risk-value approach. Because we know there's some common risks on projects. We know that at the beginning of a project, you know, not only do we have to you know, sort of get funding, that, would, that wouldn't be such a bad thing, but we should also make sure our stakeholders are all, are all going in the, in the same sort of direction. Because if I've got some stakeholders thinking we're going that way, and some thinking we're going that way, and some thinking we're going that way, we're pretty much screwed. Right? This is a project team that's going to be in serious trouble for a long time until they can finally herd those cats and start getting them going in a semi-common direction. We might want to prove the architecture early in the project, maybe with working code, you know, learning fast or failing fast, whatever you want to call this. But let's make sure that you know whatever direction we're going in is actually a good direction. Because if it's not a good direction, let's start going. Let's either cancel the project because it's a bad idea, or maybe let's go in a different direction and, and you know uh, make sure we're actually successful. So there's ways we can increase our our chance of success by being a little bit smarter about the way the way that we work. And we might, you know, and then, you know, when are, when, you're, when are you actually successful, you know, from the point of view of a project? Um, are you successful when you deploy? Or are you successful when you have delighted stakeholders? One of, one of the things Mary was talking about in her new book is she's got an entire chapter on delighted customers or delighted stakeholders. <coughs> Absolutely critical. So, you know, my observation is, yeah, well, you know, anybody can deploy. That's not such a big deal. But I should be able, I should be deploying things that people want to buy or people want to use. Is deploying crap that nobody's interested in? That doesn't sound successful to me. So I don't know when you want to say transition is over, the deployment is over, but it's one of those two things I would think. So anyways, we can look at it a bit differently. We can start bringing some aspects of governance. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, that was another swear word. Governance. You are being governed. No matter, you know, how, you know regardless of what your philosophies are, somebody is keeping an eye on things like the money, what you're producing, are you getting value, are you doing the right thing? Basic fundamental questions are being answered by somebody. Might not be you, you might not be aware that you're being governed, but somebody's definitely keeping an eye on it. If you had to go and ask somebody for money, if somebody gives you a paycheck for doing work, you are being governed. 
Would it not be nice to be governed effectively? Wouldn't that be good? Would it not be nice, instead of complaining about how senior management is stupid and they get in the way and you know, they're the people we send for pizza or we've got a scrum master who blocks the rest of the organization? How ignorant is that, right? We have to have somebody to block everybody else. Why not help those other people to work together effectively with us? I shouldn't be, you know, if I've got to block senior management, something is seriously wrong. Let's help senior management become more effective and to help me and make life easier for me. So a little bit of work, a little bit of discussion about how, do, how, can, how can senior management help me, and you know what, maybe they'll be helpful. Or we could block them and have political fights and all that sort of stuff. It's up to you. I would rather be respectful of what they're trying to achieve. Maybe respect the fact that maybe they know some, about something that's going on that I don't, and it can help me, because they might be looking at the bigger picture. They might be thinking about things that aren't even on my radar scope. So let's get effective governance. That's all Bill Brady's dad, if you're interested in that. We all know that even delivery, so this is a delivery life cycle, not so bad. We all know that this isn't, this also is inaccurate, because our teams don't work in a vacuum. There's another, there's an organization around us. So in some companies, it's not only are you building stuff, but you might, your team might also be level three support for what's up and running in production right now, right? You, you know, you're working on release 17 or something, release 16 is up and running in production, and you're getting enhancement requests and defect reports coming in for that. Sometimes something very bad happens in production, you gotta stop your effort and go and fix it and you know, put a patch in, whatever, whatever it takes. The majority of Agile teams are in that situation, so let's make it explicit. Let's take some of the surprise out of it. Let's take some of the, how do we do this discussion out of it and just say, yeah, this is how it's done. Because it's not that hard, but why does, everybody, you know, why does everybody have to figure this out on their own, right? Why can't we just give them a little bit of help? And it's in many organizations, well, in all organizations, somebody had to come up with this idea of this product or project that you're working on. Somebody must have prioritized it. You might even have some sort of enterprise architecture group underway, hopefully helping you, giving you some good advice. That doesn't always happen, but Hopefully, and it's possible for that to happen, by the way, if you choose to work with them effectively. So we can build that right in as well. We can be smarter about it. So there's a bunch of stuff that's going on that if we look at the bigger picture, now unfortunately, this is a complex diagram. I apologize for that. But you know what? Software development is hard, or solution development, I should say. It's hard. Sorry. Wait. it is. But we also know most organizations one size does not fit all. This is a, 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 you know, what we call the basic or the, the scrum-based approach. It's a good approach. But some teams are in like sustainment teams, or some teams are, you know, want to be a little more lean. We've got, this conference is a perfect example. We've got the Agile track, and we've got the lean track, right? In your organization, you've probably got some Agile-ish teams, you've probably got some lean-ish teams, you've probably got some waterfall-ish teams, and that's okay, right? Hopefully they're all doing a good job. So one size does not fit all. So in that, because one of the goals, we didn't want to be prescriptive. We don't prescribe a single life cycle. That would be inappropriate. Even in reasonably small organizations, right? I, I work in a large range of organizations. One organization I'm working in right now has about 35, 40 IT people. And even in a small organization like that, they still have some lean teams and they still have some agile teams. And that's okay. I'm working in another organization, two or 300 people in the IT department. They certainly have um, teams doing different things. So this is more of a lean uh, project life cycle. And what's interesting is that, you know, I probably freaked everybody out with these phases, but what's interesting, if you keep the team together over time, if you start looking at it from the point of view of a product and not a project, so you, 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 you maybe a, you train your resource managers to stop worrying about utilization and instead start worrying about value, then what happens is over time, and if the team is learning, the, the bookend phases, inception and transition, start to shrink. Because if I, you know, in the very first release of something, there's a little bit of, a lot of upfront thing to do. You know, what's the basic scope? What's the architecture? What's the basic plan? But once I, get, once I release it in production, if the team starts on Monday into the next release, well, we pretty much know what the scope of the next release is. Um, it's, you know, whatever we haven't gotten to yet, right? We pretty much know what the architecture is. It's, well, whatever's up and running. So, you know, the, it, we know what the team is, so we don't have to put the team together again. So, inception, it's pretty short, pretty quickly. Hopefully we're learning, and you know, we're starting to adopt some continuous delivery uh, type, type uh, techniques, and transition starts to shrink because we automate the heck out of everything. 
So over time, the phases disappear. Inception can disappear almost instantaneously after a few releases. Transition ends up shrinking from a phase down to an activity. Yeah, one of the things that I do, if you don't know who I am, I, I run industry level surveys on a regular basis to find out what's actually happening out there as opposed to what the vendors and consultants are telling us what's happening. And it's often the difference of night and day. The average Agile team spends one month, on average, doing deployment for every release. One month. The average Agile team spends two weeks for, uh, in a, for the length of an iteration or sprint. So when somebody tells you that, oh, and, and for inception, it's roughly about one month as well. So when somebody tells you that this is a sprint and this is a sprint, uh, no, please do the math. This is two sprints, the length of two sprints and the length of two sprints here. Uh, but anyway, on average, you know, your mileage will vary, of course. But over time, uh, hopefully everything went down, you'll get more into a continuous deployment type of, type of, uh, type of mode. So here's the, here's the life cycle of the lean version of the continuous delivery life cycle. So, and there, obviously there's a, you know, an agile scrum-based one as well. Um, where the things have shrunk as well. So the point is, is that different teams will be doing different things because they're in different situations. And that's okay. So if you want a real reasonable process framework to help you, then you need to look at something. Either you need to combine all the stuff on your own, do all this work yourself, which is, might be interesting if you're a process-oriented type of person, or start with something in the middle as opposed to something that's really small. It's up to you. Because we take a look at, not only are we taking a look at the full life cycle, we're also looking at, at technical issues as well as the, the management stuff that Scrum does. We have uh, you know, a few more roles than what we see in Scrum. We bring in the, the architecture owner role. Uh, one of the things that um, I sort of switched over from the, the word customer to stakeholder. Um, I think another problem that we've run into over time in the Azure community, this is pretty easy to observe as well, is this focus on the customers has been, it's been good but it's been a bit dysfunctional as well. Because too many people think, oh, it's the end users, the business folks, and obviously they're important, but you also have technical stakeholders, the enterprise architects, the operations people in your organization, the regulatory people, the auditors, you know, whatever they're called in your organization, the financial people in your organization. There's a wide range of stakeholders that you need to make sure that you're you know, doing whatever it is, you know, conforming to, their, uh, to whatever their desires are. So the role of product owner can be brutal because of this wide range of stakeholders. Even with just customers, it's still a brutal role, but um, it's a really tough role. So I prefer to use the term stakeholder you know, from, the, from the 1990s, because it's a heck of a lot more accurate and you know, a little more obvious what's going on there than the term customer. So we can do better, we can learn as we go in the Azure community. And at scale, we start to see some of these secondary roles. I'm not gonna get into the detail here too much. We see, oh, independent testing was interesting. Um, one of the examples that Mary was talking about in her talk was Intel, and they had an independent testing effort underway. Because at scale, when you're dealing with really complex problems, which, are, which is what Intel is obviously dealing with, um, you start realizing this whole team, the whole team concept from Agile starts to fall down. And actually, I think uh, Mary was using the terms basic Agile and advanced Agile and beyond Agile. Uh, and the beyond Agile people were doing independent testing. I, I can still consider that Agile, but you know, be that as it may, it's a different terminology, but that's okay. Oh, we baked DevOps right into, take, let's take some of the mystery out of that as well. Um, so governance is baked right into that. I've, I've talked about that a little bit. So we've got these light, lightweight milestone reviews. As a, and some of them are, are, are explicit in, um, in Scrum. They talk about, you know, questioning the project viability at the end of every sprint. Um, they imply sufficient functionality or a uh, minimally marketable release or product, whatever you want to call that. Uh, so there's a bunch of stuff that's already built into Scrum, but there's a few ideas adopted from Rub, some ideas adopted from Lean. Uh, all good stuff. I think this robust stakeholder definition thing is critical. I'll talk about enterprise awareness in a second on the next slide. Yeah, so one of the other ideas, and uh, one of the other observations that we made was that the Agile teams that were effective were the ones that realized that they weren't the center of the universe. So one of the really good things about Agile, one of the things they really like about Agile is there's been the, there's this very clear message around the, the importance of, of people working together in teams. And, you know, and that's way better than what we, you know, we used to see in the old world, you know, people work in cube, they do their thing, throw it over the wall to the next person, and then everybody, everybody would act surprised and things didn't work out so well. So in Agile, we realized, well, let's get these people together, let's get them to work, work together as a team, let's break down the barriers of communication. 
You know, the team is responsible, the whole team with all the skills they need, team is responsible for getting things up the door. That's wonderful. But you know what? In any decent sized organization, there's multiple teams. Wouldn't it be nice if those multiple teams were all sort of going in the same direction? Wouldn't it be nice if they weren't stepping on each other's feet? Wouldn't it be nice if they were working to, to some sort of a common goal, some sort of a common infrastructure, or at least evolving and building out the common infrastructure over time, right? So let's spend the money wisely. So let's make sure that my team is doing something that reflects the realities of this lady's team, and this lady's team, and so on. So let's be working together as an organization, not just as a collection of silo teams. So we can up our game a little bit more by looking at the bigger picture. This is a, a basic lean concept. Let's optimize the whole. We shouldn't be optimizing, you know, it's nice that we can locally optimize how my team works and how this lady's team works and so on, but we really need to optimize the organization. And this is, a, I, th I believe, a fundamental message in the Lean community. Let's look at the big picture. Let's figure out how all this stuff works together. And let's work together as an, as a, as an enterprise, as a company, whatever you want to call this. So let's reuse stuff. And we always, we've been talking about reuse for decades. We really don't pull it off except at a very small scale of reusing code now, which is great. But we can do a lot better. So um, let's do that. So anyway, so there's some room for improvement in, uh, in you know, the the core Agile community, the mainstream Agile community, whatever you want to call that. Another thing to get rid of the, some of the, a lot of the prescription um, that we see in the Agile community is being goal driven, not, um, not procedural driven, or not process driven. So an observation I would like you to make this afternoon. So this afternoon when we're doing, you know, we're doing the open space stuff, what's going to happen is, you know, you're all going to, if you've ever done open space before, there'll be this little bit of a session where you know, people uh, will suggest topics and then you'll split up and then you know, you'll attend whatever topic you want. And then as groups, whoever wants to talk about a certain topic will get together and we'll talk about it and share their experiences and people will move back and forth. It's all good stuff. And, but what will happen? So there'll be topics, you know, some people will say, how do you fund an Agile project? Or how do you do outsourcing an Agile? And how do you do this? And how, do you, how does architecture fit in? How does this fit in? How do, how do testers fit in? I'm a BA, how do I do Agile BA? You know, Whatever topic people are interested in, these topics will get suggested and whoever wants to you know, talk about them will get together and talk about them. And what will happen, the pattern that you'll see over and over and over again in all these sessions will be, you know, somebody say, well, in my organization, you know, to address this topic, we're doing blah, blah, blah. And it works pretty good, but, you know, we ran into these problems or we can't, haven't quite figured this out yet, you know. And then somebody else will say, well, yeah, you know, we tried that, but that didn't work, but we did this. And then this person will say, well, you know, we didn't do anything at all, but we're doing this. And so the observation to make is that these three people are in different situations. <laughs> so even though they're addressing the same goal of how do we fund a project, how do we do risk management, how do we coordinate activities between projects or within a team, you know, whatever topic that session is dealing with, they've all got different strategies for addressing that same basic goal because they're in different, they're different people in different situations. But they're addressing these same fundamental goals. So wouldn't it, and, what, and, what, and the reason why this open space stuff is so attractive to people is you can get together, you can share different strategies, and you can hear each other and hopefully pick up some great techniques. Well, wouldn't it have been nice to have had a source to go to for, well, when I'm trying to secure funding, what are the different ways I can fund an agile project? What are the trade-offs that I'm making? So when somebody's saying, well, we've got to do a fixed detailed estimate up front, what ammunition, you know, what, what are the advantages and disadvantages of that? How can I argue against this really questionable approach of funding an IT project and maybe move them towards more time materials or more of a, a continuous or drip funding type of a financing mechanism or, or one of several other, stage gate or whatever else, right? So wouldn't it be nice to be able to, to choose the most appropriate technique to begin with and understand what the implications were of that, and then act, act accordingly. So anyways, listen to each other in the open space sessions today, and then step back and observe this basic fundamental thing as you're addressing the same basic issues, but in different ways, because you're in different situations. So context counts. So how do you deal with that in a process framework? It's just the question I had to answer. Um, so what we did is, so well first of all, you know, we identified, that, I believe that's 22, uh, basic goals that you've got to address at certain points in projects, or, and in some cases all the way through a project, or the goals you might want to address. 
Um, so for example, one of the goals is how, how do we explore the initial scope? So at the, at the beginning of a project, how do we do it? It's more than just putting together a stack of index cards in most cases. So, you know, I'm sure if that just bursts somebody's bubble. Uh, but you know, we've got to decide you know, what level of detail do we, do we want to go to? Um, yeah, do we want to do a, you know, the evil big detailed requirements spec? Do we want to do a stack of index cards? You know, whatever, right? Do we want to just be goal driven? The largest project in mankind's history was based on one goal. The goal was we will put a man on the we will put men on the moon by the end of this decade and return them safely to Earth. Now, you know, JFK was a little more elegant than that, but that was a multi-billion-dollar, multi-year project. At the height, it was 200,000 people working on it, and the entire requirements document was one sentence. So we can now, you know, we're not always putting, you know, we're not always doing a moonshot, but you know, if it's, you know, if the, if the U.S. government can pull it off, you know, <laughs> anybody can. So that's all like it is. Anyways, so there's different ways, different levels of detail. Um, there's different ways you want to manage your, uh, you know, the work items or the requirements. You know, a, a strong product backlog is just one of them. Another one is like a work item pool that talked about in Kanban. Maybe even the evil formal change management. Point is, you've got choices, and you're making important trade-offs. So let's make these trade-offs intelligently. Wouldn't that be nice? So in the in the book, uh, we talk you know we, we talk about all these different techniques. We talk about here's the advantages and disadvantages of each. Here's when you might want to consider doing them, and here's you know and sometimes it's really don't you really don't want to do this in some in most situations. So for example, a detailed requirements document, not such a good idea in about 99% of all situations, but there are a few situations where it does in fact make sense. So let's respect that. Let's choose intelligently. Um, here's another another example of a of a goal. So uh, in, during construction, we need to address changing stakeholder needs. Once again, it's a little more to it than having a stack of uh, stack of index cards. Um, there's different ways we can do it. You know, do we accept change in the middle of the iteration, or do we wait and put it on the stack and address in the future iteration? Um, how are we going to interact? How do stakeholders interact with the team? Um, so there's a bunch of different issues that we need to consider, and you're implicitly considering many of them. You might not understand that you're addressing these things. But when you step back and think, yeah, you know what, Scrum, you know, we're doing Scrum and they prescribe a product backlog, they prescribe that we don't let the, let the requirements change in the middle of a sprint, they prescribe that we go through a product owner, they prescribe this, they prescribe that, and that's great, but that's only one configuration. Kanban has another, well, it's a little more robust, but it has a different configuration and other methods, have other, and then you, but you create your own configuration to meet your own needs. Because you're in a unique situation. One size is not fit all. And I think you're going to hear that. So choose wisely. If you're old enough to remember the, the Raiders of the Lost Ark movies, or young enough, as the case may be. Um, but anyways, so choose wisely. And so this afternoon, listen to people and step back and observe, yeah, this does, see, does in fact seem to make sense. There are different ways of doing things. Let's do it. So what does it mean to scale Agile? So. Sometimes you have big teams. You know, you can have agile teams of two people. I, I don't. I don't believe in the rhetoric of a team of one. It seems like a lonely team to me. There's a, probably some poetry there to be written. But um, and teams of hundreds. I I have been on successful agile team or successful agile programs of many hundreds of people doing mission critical software that probably affect your daily lives. It is possible. Now, I think obviously a team of five people will work differently than a team of 50 than a team of 500. So that's going to affect the way you tailor your approach. It's going to affect your tooling choices. It's going to affect your team structure choices. You know, it's pretty hard to have a, you know, a co-located team of 500 people working together. I've actually been on a one single project of 300 people all in the same room. It was brutal, but you, know, you can do it. Uh, not well in that case, but it was, you know, they physically did it. Uh, sometimes you're geographically distributed. And we like to talk about being co-located, and that's a phenomenally good idea. The minority of Agile teams are co-located. The minority. I think we need to start, I think we need to start admitting that for ourselves. So if you've got people working in cubes, you're, you're geographically distributed. You re you're laughing, but it's true, right? I'm sure some of you have seen situations where you know, you're in one queue, somebody's two or three cubes over, and instead of getting up and talking to them, you send them an email or a text, right? How sad. 
Get off your butts. <laughs> really, please. Um, your, your success rate goes down by several, it's measurable. Your success rate goes down by several percentage points by inflicting cubicles on people. Let alone if you're on different floors, different buildings, or different countries. The more geographically distributed you are, the lower your success rate. Your risk goes up, your success rate goes down, your costs go up. It's just bad, bad news. And the, my, and the majority of Agile teams are geographically distributed in some way. So you're taking on a lot of risk. Now, take that risk on intelligently, but obviously a team that's spread across the planet will work in a different manner than a team that's all in the same room. So let's respect that. Sometimes we're organizationally distributed. We, you know, it's, it's nice when everybody works in the same division of a single company. A little harder, we have multiple divisions involved, politics occur. A little harder, we got some contractors or consultants involved. Harder yet if you're doing outsourcing. Here's actually a real agile team. Uh, this is a, a dad team from about a year ago. In a regulatory environment, this is a single team of about 25 people. You can see most of the people here. There's a few people over here that you can't see. I think one or two over here you can't see. Um, one single room, one single team of 20, it's not a team of teams, it's one single team of 20, roughly 25 people. And they had a 10 minute coordination meeting every day. They're doing a common, yeah, they're, they're doing a common approach, not their own approach, but um, and that's okay. Very, very interesting. And there's a few contractors involved here, uh, but they're all on the same team. Sometimes you've got compliance issues. Roughly a third of Agile teams have some sort of compliance issue. Yeah, we've got Sarbanes-Oxy, you might be in an FDA environment. Maybe, you're, maybe you inflict CMOI or ISO type stuff upon yourselves, or have that inflicted upon you, as the case may be, right? That changes the way you work. It changes the way that you interact with people. It changes, uh, might change the tooling you're using, might change the team structure a bit, might change the roles on the team. You need to respect that. I, I, I'm, I would hope. It's obvious that you know, a team in a life-critical FDA environment will work slightly differently than a team that's just building a website with you know, no sort of you know, life-critical issues be dealing with. Sometimes we've got domain complexity. You know, on the simple end, we're building websites. In the medium ground, maybe we're doing uh, financial processing systems. And in the more complicated system, systems, maybe we're doing air traffic control systems. I think it's fairly clear that a team building an air traffic control system will work in a slightly more sophisticated manner than a team building an informational website. Not exactly rocket science, right? So that's an aspect of scaling. As is technical complexity. It's pretty easy when you're building on one platform with new technology, all the bang tools, a little harder to have multiple platforms to support. A little harder yet when you've got legacy systems that you've got to interact with, maybe even evolve. Harder yet when you have legacy data that you either have to inter you know, use or, worse yet, evolve and, and uh, fix accurately. Um, so, we need to respect that as well. Different teams, once again, facing different technical complexities. So that's going to affect the way that they work together. Pretty obvious, right? So it's not, so, so the, the challenge here. So this afternoon, when you're listening to each other, when you're collaborating in these open space sessions, ask yourself, wait a minute, is somebody telling me? So when they're telling me, and this guy's telling me about some technique that they're doing, that seems like a total disaster for me. Was well, it because he's building an air traffic control system and I'm only building a website? If so, he's probably doing something more complicated than me, and rightfully so. So let's take this, and so the reason why I talk about these various scaling factors and promote them is that when we, once, once we start recognizing that we're in, different, in these different situations, that, we're, that my team is dealing with different issues than your team is, that's gonna motivate me, each of us to do different things. And we could be in the same company. I could be on the team building the website in the company, he could be on the team building the aircraft control system for our company. That's fair, right? So from a point of view of a senior manager who has to support this, my team will get governed in a different way than his team. The enterprise architecture team will interact with me a little bit differently than with his team because I gotta think they could benefit from architecture a little bit more than maybe the website, who knows, right? So, People in different situations. So this is where some of the secondary roles kick in when we start dealing with these complexities. I mean, a regulatory environment, some regulatory environments insist on independent testing. Doesn't mean that all the testing needs to be independent, but some of it does. If I'm dealing with great technical complexity, it probably behooves me to have an independent test team, exactly as Mary was saying Intel was doing. They've got, a, you know, they've got some technical complexity, so they're dealing with them accordingly. 
They figured it out. And Mary's telling the story of how they put 100 people or whatever it was and they get together little teams and, and figure all the stuff out. One heck of a lot of work went on there. They spent months doing that, which is great. They did it. They learned. They got better. But it might have been, you know, they up their game a bit. Maybe they could have gotten ahead of that, right? So anyways, they've done it faster, they've done it cheaper. Who knows? So some scaling practices. So it's not just about the, you know, the, you know, the various practices you hear about in XP and all this other stuff. They're all great practices, but there's more to it than that. So the point here, oops, the point here is that there's a lot of options available to you. I'll hear about some of them this afternoon, I guess. So let's just, uh, you know, keep our mind, you know, have an open mind when we get to all this good stuff. So, what does it mean to be an enterprise, a, 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 an agile enterprise? That's the real enterprise, by the way. All you young whippersnappers who don't know what the enterprise looks like. I'm not like in a new movie, it's just way too fancy for me. Okay, so context counts. So we talk about that. So, um, all the agile, you know, the agile stuff is great. There's a bunch of great ideas there, but it really is all about crawling. You know, we've gotten good, we've gotten going at that, but we really need to look at least be able to say, here's end to end how all this stuff fits together. Here's how we're making intelligent choices for dealing with these technical issues. Let's work together effectively. And then finally, once we get good at delivering consistently in fairly straightforward situations, then we can start dealing with some of these scaling complexities, right? Yeah, if you're brand new to Agile or brand new to Lean, I certainly wouldn't start with a 500 person team spread across the planet. I'd probably start with a small, you know, a team of seven people in a room, in a single room, developing something fairly straightforward. Let's get some experience and then we'll uh, move on from there. And IT is about more than solution delivery. Like I've been focusing about delivery, but we know we got to operate and support this stuff once we produce it. We have HR or people issues we're going to deal with, portfolio management, program management, governance, enterprise architecture, reuse or asset management, or as you call it, data or information management. There's a bunch of stuff, and more than this, a bunch of stuff going on in IT that we need to be concerned about. So we can, op we can locally optimize delivery, but if the data guys take three months to add a column to a database, I'm really starting out of luck, aren't I? Right? So we, we've got to be agile, at least within the IT department. We've got to up our games. And it's interesting, we can rant and rave about SAFE and Scrum and DAD and you know, whatever you know, framework of your choice. None of us are looking at this full picture yet. You know, SAFE, you know, DAD is clearly focused on this. Scrum is focused on any big little part of this. DAD, you know, uh, SAFE is taking on small portions of this and this, a little bit of this, talk about this. Sort of talk about this, um, which is great, which is great, right? They, everybody, everything's got their scope, but I can't point to a single thing that addresses all that scope. And this is only a smaller part of the overall picture from your organization. This might only be five percent of the spend in your company, or ten percent of the spend, is, you know, whatever the numbers are, right? It's only a small part of the overall organization, an important part, but there's other important parts. You should all be agile, but it's strive to be agile or strive to be lean or you know whatever your whatever your goal is. So we need to think about that. Right, so it's fractal. Um, so anyway, so this is a apologize for the quality of these graphics. But you know, we saw we saw this sort of thing building up over time where you know from a development point of view or delivery point of view, things are a little more complex. We also saw this idea of being uh, enterprise aware, moving away from the, just the individual to the team to the entire company. So the implication is, is that all these scaling factors, you know, having a full delivery life cycle, you know, understanding end to end how this agile stuff and lean stuff all fits together, being able to deal with these complexity factors, these scaling factors, this is applicable at the personal level, it's applicable at the team level, at the IT department level, and at the enterprise or the organization level. This is a huge freaking issue. This is why these agile transformations are rough. This is why you know, it's hard to point to an agile or lean organization. It really is. Um, you know, you know, everybody's always talking about Toyota being lean. Okay, but what's the other what's the other lean company? Ooh, uh oh, is that crickets I hear? Right? There's a couple others, yeah, but certainly not. You know, in the Fortune 500, how many how many of those companies are truly agile or truly lean? One or two, maybe, maybe, right? 
So there's room for growth here. <coughs> a little room for opportunity. And it's a hard problem. Very hard problem. And I don't think anybody's got a solution yet. I've got a problem, I don't have a solution. Anyways, that's good to have. So some parting thoughts. Like I started out with, we need to start thinking outside the box. Um, I think a, a real danger in the Agile Lean community right now is we oversimplify things. You know, Scrum versus Kanban, or Scrum versus Safe, or Safe versus this. Uh, those are fun conversations, perhaps, but clearly they're all missing the picture. We need to we need to think outside. You know, whatever box you're in, we need to think outside of it. We need to be looking at the bigger picture. We, we really do. So, you know, wonderful wonderful learn wonderful opportunities for growth and for learning. Some of the things that were that Mary was talking about. We have an interesting challenge ahead of us. So what does it mean to be disciplined? I, I get hassled, but oh Scott, you evil bastard you. You're you're you know, what is this disciplined agile? Agile is disciplined. You don't need to throw another adjective in the front of that. Well no, there's more there's more to it, right? Yes, there's some discipline in agile, without a doubt. Being successful at agile requires more discipline than what we saw in the traditional world, by far. There's no doubt about that. But we can up our game. Being enterprise aware requires discipline because you know what? There's some things at the enterprise level that aren't that fun to deal with, like governance and all you know, getting money, you know, earning money, and all you know, getting money paid. And there's a bunch of stuff that's happening at the enterprise level that isn't this fun programming thing that we enjoy. So we need to we need to learn being you know being older and not just we're looking for one way of doing things, but understand there's multiple ways and having to choose between them. And what I choose on my team today might be different than what we're choosing to do three or four months from now, because as we learn, as we evolve, we're actually holding retrospectives, our process will be evolving. So let's, you know, let's let, let it evolve. Streamlining the upfront and the back end stuff. Um, Forrester has some very coherent evidence that all these so-called scrum teams are really waterfall scrum team, where we're doing all this big upfront stuff, taking on a heck of a lot of risk doing that, doing scrum in the middle, and then going off to a dysfunctional release or deployment phase, right? And it's because we're only looking at construction. We're only, and we're not looking at the bigger picture. How does delivery work end to end? That's right? so one of the things I think Mary was sort of getting at too, right? Now look at the entire, when you look at the entire process, let's squeeze it out. You know, it's not just, you know, what my group is doing, it's what everybody's doing together end to end is what counts. So until we start looking end to end, we start starting to streamline everything, like construction as well as inception and transition, we're not really gonna be successful. We gotta look at the bigger picture here. Uh, and and I'll, I'll, I'll swear yet again, governance is critical. If you don't if you don't come if you don't go to senior management with a coherent way to govern agile projects, including metrics, by the way, uh, you're gonna get governed in a dysfunctional manner. And you shouldn't whine about that. Either step up and deal with the issue, or stop complaining about management not getting it and management getting in your way and making things harder for you. Either choose to help them or choose to accept whatever they inflict upon you. I would rather choose to help them and make my world a little bit better. And there's ways to do that. And the first step is to start using terms like this and accepting that this is happening. So anyways, think about that. So this, this, this no metrics movement, good luck with that. Yeah. And, Little children on the playground yapping. That's all that is. But anyways, there's good ideas there. But think of, you know, can you imagine being a senior executive and somebody coming to you? I don't need to give you an estimate because it's a waste. You don't need to measure what I'm doing because it's a waste. Okay, junior programmer, shut up and get back to your cube. That's going to be, you know, they won't be that blatant, but that's what they're thinking. It's like blah, 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 you have another programmer yapping. Laptop. One more minute. All right, let's wrap it up. Okay, so foundation. This is the foundation of scaling agile. So there's a bunch of great ideas out there. Let's leverage them. So that, in many ways, is the glue that shows how all this good stuff fits together. So you can either figure it out on your own, which I'm sure you've seen is a bit of a struggle, or let's move into the middle. We'll start from there. And then once we figure it out how to do it end to end, then we can start dealing with these interesting. Scaling factors, these complex, other complexities that get in the way, <laughs> that make life a little bit harder, a little challenging. We've got a, we've got a, a workshop coming up in uh, about two months, I guess. Uh, I mean, we haven't quite nailed down the uh, location yet, but it'll be in Midtown somewhere. So it'll be a one-day advanced workshop, which will be driven by you. 
It'll be a, not quite open spacey, but it'll be fairly close. So interesting, it'll be an interesting way to do it. Good thing. But anyways, so uh, consider that if you're interested. And uh, thank you for coming. And I'll be around uh, during the lunch period. We'll we've got some sort of book booth thing going on, and we'll be eating, I guess. And uh, if you have any questions, hunt me down and talk to me. Thank you very much. <laughs>